from New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start with the markets today because the stock market particularly is showing it's headed toward a worst result since April 1. And we welcome now Abigail Doolittle for a market check. Abigail? Well, David, we are certainly looking at a bit of a sell-off at this point for stocks having to do with that crude oil volatility and, of course, that historic move lower for crude oil finally bleeding into other asset classes because the two weeks into this week, if you can believe it, crude oil had been down both of those weeks, both of those weeks down about 20%, so losing about 40% over that time period. The S&P 500 at that time, though, up about 15%. So today we are seeing declines for stocks, again, caused by uh, that move lower for oil, which has to do much with the virus crisis and the demand destruction. Plus, some folks are talking about the idea that for that May contract, there's no storage. But take a look at the June contract, absolutely plunging as well. $13 per barrel, down 35% on the session. So the carnage that we've seen for oil is not over. Not surprisingly, we do have a, a rally for bonds as the, in this on this as investors are seeking for safety. But the bigger question here, David, is it seems that crude oil is really pricing in uh, some sort of a deep recession, maybe even something worse, whereas stocks on the year, the S&P 500 down, but down just about 10%, perhaps still pricing in that V-shaped recovery or the U-shaped recovery. Which side is right? It's unclear right now, perhaps the truth is somewhere in the middle. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that market check. In the meantime, it's clear that President Trump really has inherited a major crisis in the White House. We bring in now somebody who's familiar with dealing with crises. He has served as the White House Chief of Staff as well as Secretary of Defense and head of the CIA, among other major positions in the U.S. government. He is Leon Panetta, and he also is the founder and the chairman of the Panetta Institute. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being with us. First, give us your view from 40,000 feet. You have dealt with crises inside of government. How is the Trump administration doing as they look at this balance between public safety with public health on the one hand and bringing the economy back on the other a difficult problem for anyone uh, it, there's no question that uh, it is a uh, it is a crisis uh, of immense proportions that uh, the White House is having to deal with and uh, you know it is it, it is the kind of moment in time where uh, the President of the United States um, really does have to have the best advisors uh, around him uh, familiar with what uh, what the challenges are here, both in health care as well as with our economy. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, the need to really unify uh, the leadership on Capitol Hill and, for that matter, unify the country. Um, this, is a, this is a crisis very similar to uh, the kind of crisis we faced uh, 75 years ago as we came out of uh, World War II. Uh, and it really does demand, I believe, the kind of uh, full-scale national mobilization and leadership that is critical to being able to uh, solve this problem. I, I'm not sure that uh, you know having 50 different states, 50 different governors uh, dealing in their own way with this crisis is going to be the ultimate answer to dealing with the coronavirus. Well, it's an interesting point because we do have 50 different states, but at the same time, we may be seeing a bit of a competition already with the state of Georgia saying, let's get back to it right away. Other states saying, no, no, that's way too fast. We're worried about our personnel. Should the government, can the government actually, federal government, really direct the states about when they can let open up their economies? Well, I think the president of the United States, uh, in providing uh, the guidance that has uh, been provided uh, at the federal level about the steps that need to be taken, in order to to deal with the coronavirus, uh, has taken a very important step, and obviously uh, the healthcare advisors have made clear uh, what needs to be done in order to try to protect the safety of the American people as we try to reopen our economy. But I, I think the, uh, I think the president, uh, I think as the commander in chief of this country, uh, has to has to really make clear that everybody has to follow. Uh, the same standards in terms of arriving at the point where they're going to open their economy. I don't think we ought to allow uh, people to just shotgun this thing. I think uh, I think the president of the United States has to be very clear that we're, he's going to protect the entire country. And uh, you know, the coronavirus 
uh, is very much something that uh, doesn't recognize borders, uh, whether they're state borders or, or national borders. This is something that's affected the entire world. And as a result of that, it is very important to have national leadership provide national standards as to how we're going to address it. And, and essential in making any of these very, very difficult public health decisions is accurate information. Uh, right now, it appears that we don't have the testing information we need. We're told that there's capacity either here or coming online, but many people think it's way short of what we need. Is the federal government doing all it can do? From your experience, are there other things it can be doing to make sure we can get all the testing done we need? Because it's tens of millions of tests, apparently. You know, in a matter no matter who you talk to or, or what you read in terms of uh, how do we ultimately get out of this crisis, uh, the answer still comes down to what I call the three T's, uh, testing, uh, tracing, uh, and ultimately treatment. Uh, and uh, testing is going to be absolutely essential uh, to our ability to begin to really open up our economy with some sense of confidence about what's happening you 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 know you can't just roll dice here you've got to be able to get an information base as to how many people have the virus how many people have had the virus how many people uh you know uh, are are healthy so that we know for a fact that when people come together uh we know what their history is uh that's going to be the reality uh that's what's uh, happened in south korea that's what's happened elsewhere is their ability to get an information base that allows us then to know, uh, you know, when you're going to put people together, whether or not they have the virus or they don't have the virus. We need that information. We can't gamble that uh, somehow uh, we don't need to know that information. And for that reason, testing is absolutely essential to that capability. Mr. Secretary, even as we in the United States and countries around the world deal with the coronavirus, there's also major issues of national security. I want to draw your attention and draw from your experience as a Secretary of Defense and also head of the CIA to what is or is not going on in North Korea. We didn't see Kim Jong-un six days ago for that big holiday, his grandfather's birthday. That's very unusual. And now there are reports, unconfirmed reports, he may be ill or even worse. What, how do you assess it? I think we always have to be very careful about uh, reports coming out of uh, North Korea. Uh, you know, the reality is uh, it is a very hard target uh, in terms of really getting credible information about what really is going on in North Korea. Uh, and for that reason, I think uh, we just have to be very careful <clears throat> to make sure that we have uh, the, the best uh, and most credible information possible uh, in trying to look at that situation. Uh, if uh, if it is true that uh, you know Kim Jong Un is uh, very ill, uh, it could have very significant impacts in terms of what happens with North Korea. It's, it becomes a dangerous moment because, very frankly, the Kim family has been the sole regime in North Korea for over 60 years, uh, and uh, if uh, if the Kim family is not around, uh, there could very well be a play for power in North Korea, and we don't know what the direction would be. So I think the first thing is to try to get the best information possible about what exactly is going on in North Korea. As far as we know, and it is very difficult to know what's going on in Pyongyang, uh, is Kim Jong-un really in charge, or does the military run the country? Well, there's no question that Kim Jong-un uh, has uh, tremendous power uh, in North Korea, just by virtue of who he is and because of the regime and because of the history in North Korea. Uh, but it's also always been true that uh, the military is the primary arm that uh, Kim Jong-un uh, requires in order to maintain control of North Korea. Uh, and so uh, the military uh, is, yes, powerful, but at the same time, uh, the military has always been very subservient to uh, uh, to Kim uh, and uh, wanting to make sure that uh, uh, Kim is uh, ultimately uh, the person who will protect the regime and protect their power as well. So it it uh, it's it is a a nasty balance here that has been maintained in North Korea for a long time. 
Uh, and if anything should happen to Kim, uh, it will really raise serious issues that have never that North Korea has never had to deal with in the past. And for that reason, it becomes a, a real security threat for us. Okay, Mr. Secretary, thank you so very much for being with us. That's Leon Panetta, former Secretary of Defense, as well as former White House Chief of Staff, now Chairman of the Panetta Institute. Thank you so much. Really great to have you with us. Coming up next, Rob Thummel of Tortoise Capital is here to try to make some sense out of a chaotic home market. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, the oil markets, I think it's fair to say, are in total chaos. Yesterday we saw the historic development of WTI futures contracts for the month of May actually go into the negative. And it's spread now today apparently into Brent and also into the June contracts. We're delighted to welcome Rob Thummel. He's portfolio manager at Tortoise Capital. Rob, thanks for being with us. First of all, give us your read on where the oil market is today because it's been moving quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, David. So thanks for having me on. So, so yeah, the oil market continues to be pressured off of concerns about short-term uh, available inventory capacity and 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 basically around the globe reaching that 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 full capacity. You know, yesterday was obviously very chaotic. Uh, yesterday was you know, I've been in, investing in energy for over two decades and, and never seen anything like it. Um, you know, just an, an example of of a scenario where you know in the oil markets you have physical buyers and you have financial buyers and. And yesterday it became, you know, very clear that financial buyers, uh, basically with contracts expiring today, did not want to become physical buyers and have to take title to that oil. And so there was a massive amount of selling by those financial buyers yesterday, and just simply no, or, uh, no buyers to buy that the, the, those contracts. And so that caused obviously the, the decline in oil prices um, yesterday. And, and obviously today we're we're seeing a little bit of a bounce back, but but in the in the uh, forward curve, as you highlight, you know, the forward curve is, is starting to see some pressure as well as, as investors become concerned about us increasing inventories to a level where we will no, no longer have any more available capacity. I suppose, Rob, one of the questions most of us have is how much of this is sort of technical, as it were? We had a lot of traders who didn't want to take physical delivery of oil. They were coming to the deadline, as opposed to really the markets telling something longer term, pretty troubling, actually, about where the economy overall is going. Because, as you say, it's largely a demand issue. How much economy will be there globally to take up this oil? Yeah, that's a very good point, David. And I think that's really important for, for, for everyone to understand. You're, you're right. The, the short term price decline yesterday uh, I would agree with you it was very technical it was because of because of the the, the, the things that you highlight the need to get your to, to get rid of those contracts you didn't have to accept physical delivery when you look at the, the economy you know no, no doubt that that obviously the the, the economy um, and, and and demand for oil will be lower uh, for, the, for for a little while here and that's why oil prices are lower um, but but also keep them keep in mind on the other side of the equation um, you know, we have an oversupplied oil market today and probably have an oversupplied oil market for a little while, but eventually we're going to have an undersupplied oil market. And, then, and, and, and the reason I say that is because of the OPEC plus production cut agreement that, that, that is in place. It's in place for an extended period of time, not just for a few months. It's actually in place for a few years, frankly. That will help uh, – keep supply down as demand returns, and that will be a positive for, for oil prices and bring them back to, to levels that are, uh, that are a little more beneficial for both consumers as well as producers. So, Rob, today President Trump tweeted out, as you well know, that we cannot let the oil industry go under. And so he's instructed his Secretary of Treasury and his Secretary of Energy to get together and come up with a plan to support the energy business in this country. What sorts of things can they be thinking about? What should they be thinking about? Well, I, I think I think the biggest the, the we really need a bridge for this for this inventory capacity and 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 how do we deal with this what hopefully is a very short term scenario where we have excess uh, this this excess supply this oversupplied oil market and, and where do you what do you do with that excess oil and that that's really the challenge around the world everybody's trying to figure out is where do we store that oil and so so you know finding additional uh, locations or places like the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to, to, to store that to store that excess oil that's being produced today um, it will, will help balance things. Um, you know, longer term, producers are actually making adjustments in the U.S. already. Uh, producers, 
announced last week. A few of them announced that they were curtailing or shutting in production. What that means is they're just slowing. They're not going to they're not going to produce uh, or reduce their production by 20 to 30 percent in the short term here. That that will and, and things actions like that will from the producer level will actually help balance this market as well. And so kind of in a in a really um, I guess volatile time right now, um, but but the market is responding and and uh, and looking to balance the market in the in the best ways that uh, that it can. At the at the same time, energy stocks have not been hurt as badly as some might have thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I think I think when as as energy investors, I think I mean, or just as investors in general, I mean. I think if you look at at, at the forward curve for for oil and 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 and, and energy is more than just about oil, by the way. There's there's a lot of other there's, there's other opportunities in natural gas that, that actually could benefit from from lower oil production. But let's just talk about the impact on oil and why energy, even though oil prices are down, energy stocks are not down as much. The, the forward curve for for oil prices is, is substantially higher. You know, as, as you highlight, uh, you know, the June contract at thirteen dollars, the May contract at five dollars, but you know, contract six months from now is at thirty dollars, right? So, so I think, uh, and, and that's been fairly steady. Um, you know, plus or minus, it's been at as high as thirty five, but didn't come back okay. down to thirty most recently. So it, it has come back down, but. But in, in energy investors, I think, and, and investors in general understand that oil prices at, its, at their current levels, $5, $13, they, that, that, that's not going to work for anybody around the world. And, and, we're, and we have the adjustments that are in place to take this oversupplied market that's causing these higher inventories and these lower prices and having that, the, 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 the adjustments that will be made to reduce that inventory over a longer period of time, which will ultimately result in higher oil prices. Okay, really appreciate it, Rob. That's Rob Thunnel. He's a portfolio manager at Tortoise Capital on oil. We're going to have much more on oil coming up later in the program because we're going to talk with the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Dan Burrett, one of the people that President Trump has told to help figure this out. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. The North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, raised eyebrows when he didn't show up for the biggest holiday of the year in North Korea. That's the birthday of his grandfather. And then there were rumors over the weekend that perhaps Mr. Kim Jong-un is ill, maybe even worse than that. And so there really is raised questions about what is the future for North Korea. We turn now to an expert. She's Ms. Soo Kim. She's a policy analyst at the RAND Corporation. She specializes in North and South Korea as well as Southeast Asia and other parts of the region. So Ms. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. What do we know, what don't we know about what's going on with Kim Jong-un right now? So I think we could say with a, a moderate level of certainty that there is something that is amiss with North Korea right now. Uh, we cannot conclude once and for all that Kim Jong-un's health is really to the point of destabilization. Uh, based on the reporting, nobody just nobody really knows exactly what is going on. Um, in the past, uh, when the regime had health issues with the leader, uh, under Kim Jong-un, they would try to either deny or to prove that their, their head leader is, is alive and well and fully functioning and going on these site visits to assure the domestic audience and also to show to the external world that we are, in fact, stable. Uh, this time, it's been about, it's been over a week since we've seen Kim Jong-un make his public appearance. Uh, the regime has not really made this clarification as to whether or not his health is in good condition or if it's in poor condition. So at this point, I think one thing that we have to keep in mind is that absolutely we still have no way to confirm whether or not his health is in this destabilized, grave situation as the, the U.S. media and some South Korean media have pointed out. So if, in fact, there is a regime change, and we don't know that there will be in North Korea, do we have any idea where it may go? Does he have an heir? I mean, he's a relatively young man. Uh, that's a very important question. I think uh, I, I checked social media this morning, and a lot of people who study North Korea have been speculating as to what would, what would actually happen. Uh, there is no designated heir apparent right now because Kim himself is a relatively young leader. Um, I understand that he has possibly several young children, but they are way too young to be even considered to be groomed or, or designated as a possible successor to their father's throne. Uh, there's speculation that his sister, um, given that she is considered his confidant, 
uh, she might be up for the the heir apparent position. But again, this is all speculation by uh, by the Western observer, so we do not know for sure. I think that uh, whether or not you know whoever gets to you know assume leadership, that's an important question, obviously. But I think the the heart of the matter is that when there is a transition, whether or not it's going to be a trans a, a smooth one or one that's destabilized, where you know the there's there's no leader in, in place, and there leads to that, that leads to destabilization. The fact of the matter is, there's going to be many many repercussions. Um, the COVID situation right now demonstrates that. Let's say that the, this pandemic spreads, um, and it just changes a lot of things in the dynamics, um, not just from people to people within one country, but the way we handle, let's say, the humanitarian situation with North Korea. If there is a collapse. If we see, you know, an outflow of refugees from North Korea out into the North Korean-China border and so forth, there's just so many different parts that I think from a perceptual angle, we, we think about it a lot and we talk about it a lot, but I just don't know whether or not we are fully, as an international community, ready to really tackle it. How could we get ready? I mean, where is the expertise? Is it in China? Is it in South Korea? Is it in our own State Department? Well, I think given that North Korea, you know, the, the nuclear weapons, the missiles, uh, the illicit, you know, activities, uh, the humanitarian issue, human rights violations, no single country is able to just take control of the North Korean crisis, the North Korean puzzle, and, and solve it by itself. It does require, I would say, a regional and a multilateral approach because there right. are so many moving parts. Right. At the same time, I think that right. um, given that, right. you know, the North Korea and South Korea, they share a border, U.S. is right. involved in, 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 in right. potential peace talks and so forth, uh, there's right. going to be certain countries that are going to be at the right. helm and other uh, countries that would play okay. a more supporting role. Okay. Thank you so very much. That's Ms. Sue Kim from Rand Corporation. Coming up here, we have Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa on the, on the plan to vote on a new spending bill this afternoon in the Senate. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. For Bloomberg First Word News, we're going to go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you very much. Americans will soon be able to test themselves for COVID-19 at home. The Food and Drug Administration has approved the first home testing kit. Officials say it's just as accurate as one you get at a doctor's office or at the hospital. Patients will collect samples and send them to LabCorp for testing. The kits are expected to be available in most states with a doctor's order in the coming weeks. President Trump will meet at the White House today with New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo. The two who have sparred in recent weeks are expected to talk about ways to step up virus testing. Governor Cuomo says ramping up testing is a key to lifting restrictions and reopening his state's economy. The governor and other state leaders want $500 billion in aid to offset outbreak-related revenue shortfalls. Britain's parliament went back to work today and the political authorities had a message for lawmakers, stay away. UK legislators and most parliamentary staff were sent home in late March as part of a nationwide lockdown to slow the spread of the coronavirus. House of Commons Speaker Lindsay Hoyle presided over an almost empty chamber with space made for a maximum of 50 of the 650 members of the UK Parliament. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. Well, today's a big day in the United States Senate. It is scheduled to have a vote at 4 o'clock this afternoon Eastern Time on a new spending cap package, reportedly including $350 billion in additional funds for small business, as well as $75 billion for hospitals and $25 billion 
for testing. Uh, that, that is supposed to happen. We've been told conflicting things. The minority leader, Chuck Schumer, said earlier today that they had a deal. Then we had Steny Hoyer, who's the number two on the House side on the Democrats, saying, well, they're close to a deal. They're not there quite yet. At the same time, there's a great deal of urgency for this because, as we know, earlier this, the Congress approved $349 billion for small businesses that went out the door very quickly. They ran through all that money, and now they're trying to appropriate another $350 billion. At the same time, at the same time, uh, they have to think about what has to happen to the state. That's a different issue, which will be the fourth round on this, is the plan. So that's what we're waiting for out of the United States Senate. Uh, and we are going to be talking with Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa about what's going on in the Senate shortly. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm told now we have Senator Chuck. Hello, Senator Grassley. Can you hear me, sir? It's David Weston somewhere in New York. How are you, yes, sir? Yes, I can hear you. I was just talking about yes, the fact I'm, that the Senate is scheduled to vote on a... Great. I was, I was just saying that the Senate, as I understand, is scheduled to vote on a spending package this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, you will be an important part of that, of course, as part of leadership on the Republican side. Do you expect a vote this afternoon, and do you expect it to be approved? Is it unanimous consent? I, it better be, because without senators being in Washington uh, making a quorum, uh, and uh, this is the only way to get it done and get it done quickly, and it should have been done uh, 10 days ago, but Democrat opposition kept it from passing at that particular time. So just for your public that wants to know how we can do something with one senator on the Senate floor, Senator Schumer calls all 47 Democrats, McConnell calls all 53 Republicans, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's called the whip line, and uh, if nobody objects, uh, then a bill can go through by unanimous consent. And we've had telephone conversations with uh, McConnell uh, as Republicans, and I'm sure Schumer's done the same thing with Democrats to discuss this pretty thoroughly. So getting the $310 billion for small business is very important. We had to agree to Democrats for more money for hospitals, which probably would eventually be needed but isn't needed now because there's still $70 billion for hospitals that haven't been spent, and then an additional $25 billion for testing. And uh, I think if it's those three things and not anything else to, uh, uh, to cause trouble uh, or disagreement, then we ought to be able to get this through at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Okay, Senator Grassley, give us some sense of the four, first $349 billion which has been dispersed. How much did that help small businesses back in Iowa, your home state? And will this other $350 billion, if that's the number, will that take care of the problem? Yeah, well, first of all, let me explain that when we put the first $350 billion up three weeks ago in the CARES Act, we thought that it was a equal amount of money. Before a few days had run out, uh, we, we knew that we would be out of money April the 17th, so that's last week. So even before that, that's when the panel tried to get it uh, passed. So you're asking me, will this additional $310 be enough? Right. I would assume so, but we might be shocked. Uh, uh, you know, so, Senator Grassley? To find out. S Senator Grassley, Sen Senator Grassley, Senator Grassley, I'm sorry, to I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. Senator Grassley, uh, this c telephone connection is really breaking up, so we're going to try to fix that. We'll come back to you shortly. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Nobody's ever seen what's going on today in the oil market. We went into negative numbers for futures in WTI yesterday. So Alex Steele, our colleague, sat down with Lord John Brown, former head of BP, and got his views on what has happening in the oil market. Production will come down, certainly in the States, as, as new production is not added 
uh, uh, to the future. Demand, I think, very sluggish indeed. It will take a long time to recover. Obviously, it's down very heavily at the moment, around about uh, 30%. Uh, but uh, even it, it'll come back, I think, slowly, uh, as people will be very reluctant to consume at the rate that they have been consuming for the behavior of people changed as a result of the virus. So I think uh, we're, I no doubt. would be no not doubt. surprised if you look at uh, oil prices being much lower for longer. So based on that, uh, the Texas Railroad Commission is going to have a meeting today where they're considering prorating cuts for Texas. Should that happen based on the scenario just laid out? Well, that could happen. It's an unusual thing to do for, I mean, I do recall when I first joined the industry that the Texas Railroad Commission was very active in managing production, and they may well do that. But even that, and combined with the uh, cuts that have been promised by OPEC+, Plus, uh, that will dig into, let's say, only 10 or plus percent uh, of uh, oil supply whereas we are producing probably 30% too much at the moment. So it will help, uh, and none of that started yet, uh, it will help uh, underpin the price a bit. But the price, I think, will be sluggish for a very long time. And you brought up OPEC+. Plus. Uh, there is conversation that they're going to move their cuts forward, maybe even take it deeper. Um, you know, the eight and a half million barrels of oil a day, OPEC's not, or Saudi Arabia has not really wanted to go below that, but maybe that could happen. Anything like that? Do a bigger dent uh, in, or help price support even more? Well, I think you really have to dent uh, uh, production a lot to support the price. But in the end, that's not sustainable. Uh, and it's exactly what we saw in 85 to 86, you know, when eventually the cuts were not sustainable. People opened up uh, the taps and the price of oil stayed low for about 17 years thereafter. Uh, there was a lot of oil. So it depends on the rate of growth of demand. Uh, and demand, I think, will, as I say, I think I can't see this uh, growing very steeply for a very long time. So I think all of these are temporary you things me, that underpin the price. Yeah. I think, Lord Brown, could you help me understand, like, the roadmap to then stronger demand? As in, does the gasoline, do gasoline inventories need to come down, then refining margins improve, then we finally soak up some of the oil in the market? When we talk about demand recovery, what's the actual process of that? Well, it is just that. First, it is uh, underlying demand for economic activity. Uh, bear in mind that uh, the rate of growth of GDP uh, determines the rate of growth of uh, oil very slowly. Uh, we are getting more and more efficient at using oil. Uh, every year, uh, we use 1.5% less oil for every increase in GDP. So uh, GDP has to come up, inventories have to be consumed, and people really want to consume, want to consume oil, so aviation, transportation, uh, industry, a variety of things like that. I do think, however, there is a much bigger overlay on this today, uh, and that is people's great concern uh, about climate uh, and the use of hydrocarbons, which generate uh, both methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, and increase global climate change. Uh, I believe this is something that will carry on. And in terms of behavior, I do think people are beginning to reflect on viruses, creating health problems, creating lung problems, uh, and uh, on, on one hand, and secondly, on a natural phenomena, natural phenomena like viruses coming to do things which are far more powerful than presidents or prime ministers can do to human beings. Climate change will be one of those things. So it wouldn't surprise me uh, that over the period that we're talking about now, the medium term, uh, that uh, climate change will remain a very important damper on the uh, consumption of crude oil. That was former BP head Lord John Brown speaking with our colleague Alex Steele. And now I'm told we have the connection reestablished with Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa. Thank you so much for your patience, sir. We have some difficulty sometimes with these phones. What we were talking about, Senator Grassley, before we got interrupted, was how things are going in Iowa, and specifically with small businesses, including some of your farmers. What is the situation in Iowa right now? 
Well, first of all, I think there's about three billion dollars came to how many thousands of small businesses. I'm not sure I can tell you, but it was uh, uh, there's still a lot of demand for it in Iowa, and uh, I think in Iowa probably more than in a, in metropolitan areas, a small business is the backbone of our economy, and uh, I think uh, I think the, the really soft spot in Iowa is agriculture because commodity prices globally are way down and the price of our grains are uh, historically low if you consider an inflation factor and uh, we have a we have some uh, viruses uh, in our meat packing plants and they're not operating at 100 percent of efficiency and you know there's kind of a very sophisticated precise uh uh, a line that you go through from a baby pig being born till five months later, uh, slaughtering it and getting it to your mouth. And uh, what do you do when you've got uh, uh, thousands of pigs that maybe can't be slaughtered because the uh, packing plants aren't operating at capacity? And it's getting to be a problem. And uh, we hope we don't have to euthanize uh, some of our livestock. But what do you do? You don't turn a uh, 250 uh, pound pig into a 500 uh, pound pig and expect to get quality meat out of it. And uh, you don't have room for new pigs being born. So it's, it's really the most immediate problem we have. And it's caused by the pandemic with a large share of the workers at the packing plants. Uh, getting the virus. Uh, and Senator Grassley, uh, there's a $19 billion coming the way of farmers, which I know are so critically important, as you suggest, in Iowa. How far will that uh, remedy some of the problems that you're seeing right now in the food processing sector? It could be end up being a spit in the ocean compared to what's going to be needed. Uh, but right now, that's what we're dealing with. And for the... Uh, we, uh, we've got to get it out to the farmers faster than it looks like the federal government's got to, to do it. You're, they, when I call up the Secretary of Agriculture, they talk about software problems, getting new regulations through the red tape in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, I think the Secretary of Agriculture is very, very sincere about getting this money out, and he's very frustrated with not being able to get it out faster but uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, it needs to be out here faster, uh, not uh, well into May, has been indicated to me. So, Senator Grassley, this is not the time to worry about it, but sooner or later we're going to have to worry about how we're going to pay for all this money going out. Is it inevitable that we're going to have to raise taxes, state taxes as well as federal taxes down the road, to pay for what we are doing for good and sufficient reason right now? Well... I think what you got to look at is, first of all, we aren't spending the money just because we love to spend money. Uh, this is the first time in the 240-year history of our country that the government, federal, state, and local, has shut down the economy. So we're the fault of it. we got to get it back up and running. And if we didn't get back up and running, we'd be in worse shape than the question you're asking me. Now, your question you're asking me is a very legitimate one. And will it, will it require uh, increases in taxes? I think the answer to that question is directly related to the ability of the economy to, uh, uh, to handle the debt. Uh, and, uh, because our country's always had some debt. So uh, for 50 years, that was about 35% of gross national product. It's going to be about 100% of gross national product pretty soon. The last time that happened was World War II. So as long as, in, as, long as uh, 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 interest rates are below the economic growth of the country, I don't think we have a problem. I don't think we have to increase taxes. If, uh, if that would inverse itself, then I think we need to uh, think about uh, raising taxes. Okay, Senator, I really appreciate your being with us and also your patience with our technical difficulties. That is Senator Chuck Grassley, Republican of Iowa. Coming up here, we're going to be talking with the Energy Secretary, Dan Briette, about plans to try to save the U.S. energy industry. 
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. And coming back from break, we now have some breaking news on the Bloomberg that an interim stimulus deal is done, according to Trump administration officials, something we were just talking with Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa. So we have a report now from the administration that that deal is done. They are supposed to vote on it in the Senate this afternoon. In the meantime, the other big story, of course, is oil and what has gone on with the oil markets in the last two days. It's been chaotic, I think it's fair to say. Earlier today, President Trump commissioned his energy secretary, Dan Briette, as well as his treasury secretary, uh, Steve Mnuchin, to try to figure out a way to help the oil industry in the United States. And now I'm delighted to say we have that secretary of energy, Dan Briette, with us. So thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. Give us a sense of where you start in figuring out how to deal with a, a, a situation we've never seen before in the oil business. Well, thank you, David. It's great to be back with you. Yes, it is an extraordinary situation that we're looking at in the marketplace today. You, you saw the numbers from yesterday. I don't think anyone, at least in my lifetime, has seen anything near that or like that. We're taking uh, very aggressive but appropriate steps to help the industry and help, uh, help this economy, if you will, get through this uh, pandemic. One of the steps that we took initially was to open up the strategic reserve, make the storage available to the industry. That's what drove some of the pricing yesterday. You'll note that the uh, folks who were closing out those futures contracts uh, couldn't take possession of the oil because, candidly, they had no place to put it. So storage is a very acute concern all throughout the industry. We've uh, now contracted to take approximately 23 million barrels of oil, put that into the strategic reserve. Uh, you also saw the president's tweet. I'm going to work closely with Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin uh, to see what we might do to look at the, uh, the laws and the facilities that Congress has directed us to create, the lending facilities, the Main Street Lending Program, other types of facilities. There's a Federal Reserve facility as well to ensure that those are available to the energy industry as well. So we're working very closely together to ensure that uh, all of the folks in the producing community have access to those types of loans, those, that type of liquidity, because right now that's, what, that's another acute concern that we have. So as you go about approaching this very difficult question, how do you strike the proper balance between, on the one hand, I know you've said it before, the president said it, you want to maintain a free enterprise system. You don't want the government just controlling these markets. On the other hand, you have to save the energy industry. How can you preserve the private sector at the same time that you save it? <laughs> well, it's a very difficult balance we're trying to strike. Uh, you know, the, the market is ruthlessly efficient at uh, weeding out high-cost producers. And in America, we, we, we honor the free market system. It's what has brought us to where we are today as a country, and that is a free and independent nation. So we want to continue that as we move forward. That being said, there are market anomalies that happen from time to time, and no one could have predicted the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic that we're all facing. And as we talked about in the past, the demand curve has moved so quickly in a downward fashion that it's, you know, the production is simply not able to keep up with it. It's not able to ramp down as quickly as the demand curve is ramped down. So as a result, we're dealing with this oversupply of oil. So our intent is to look at what we can do, things like the storage that we just talked about, but also with regard to some of the things that, you know, Congress has generously provided this industry. Uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of, for, you know, perhaps uh, uh, deducting losses that are incurred this year against the last five years of profits. Those are important right. liquidity tools right. that we're going to help the industry make it, take advantage of. Mr. Secretary, what about uh, curtailing some of the supply? That is to say, for example, banning imports of oil, particularly from Saudi Arabia. That's something that's been mentioned in the press. may not be on your agenda. Sure. The, the president has not uh, taken any of those options off the table. He, he will continue to evaluate the situation at whatever time is appropriate. He'll make those decisions. Uh, but he has stated repeatedly, and I'll state it again, he, is, he, is, he, is, he will avail himself to any option available to him to help this important industry make it through this pandemic. You know, with regard to the imports of oil, it's important to remember that certain refineries in the United States are set up to take specific types of oil. And there's a fundamental difference between, you know, being dependent upon the import of oil, as we were in 1973 and 1974, and simply trading oil, which is what you see in the marketplace today. Uh, many refiners choose to import uh, heavy, sour crude because that's, 
uh, for them the most efficient, most economical way to maintain a, a profitable status for their businesses. But that's trade, that it's not dependent, it's not dependent on the imports. Right. Okay, Mr. Secretary, I really appreciate you being with us. As I say, you've got a lot on your platter right now trying to figure out what to do about the oil sector. That is Secretary Dan Briette. He is the Secretary of Energy. Coming up next, we have a second hour of Balance of Power over on Bloomberg Radio. We're going to talk, among other things, with Bill Richardson, who knows North Korea terribly well, having traveled there often uh, as an emissary, often to try to release, get the release of U.S. prisoners of the North Korean regime. That's coming up on Balance of Power on radio, the second hour. That does it for Balance of Power on television for today. I'm David Weston.